Thank you, Alka. Um, yeah, the sun is uh, the sun. A lot of people think that it's just there and there hasn't been really much exploration in terms of that. If you look at the ancient Mayans and the Incas, they saw the sun basically as this heavenly body, as a god that gave them life. Um, and they worshipped it for that. We actually stepped in as amateurs, as professionals, and started looking at the sun in a totally different light. The sun is just not another pretty picture for us. There's a lot of scientific value in it. And apart from getting some nice photos, there's a lot that the sun can tell us about where we come from. Um, Ray and I spoke about it briefly. Um, one example, the sun is 150 million kilometers from us. And a lot of people say if it was further from us, life would not exist. But what if life could have adapted in terms of that temperature or even if the sun was closer? So those are all still questions that's out there that's, that's looming. Sun is an average yellow star, so there's nothing special about it. But for us, there's a lot of special things that we can look at in terms of observing. Those I'm going to cover basically in terms of your prominences, your filaments, flares, and my favorite subject is obviously sunspots. <laughs> to give you guys a bit of a, an idea, the, the, the sun's ratio towards the earth, can you guys see there? Okay, as you can see, there's there we are, somewhere on that little black spot, compared to the sun. Now, you think the sun is big. Now look at that. There's the sun, compared to Sirius, and eventually to Arcturus. So now the sun isn't all that big. If you can see that little pixel right there, that's the sun compared to Betelgeuse. In Orion. Now, here's a mind blowing fact. Here's a nice comparison Mercury, Mars, Venus, the Earth. Earth, Neptune, Uranus, Saturn, Jupiter. Jupiter, Proxima Centauri, the Sun, Sirius. Uh, Sirius in comparison to Aldebaran. Aldebaran in comparison to Betelgeuse. Betelgeuse in comparison to. The latest hypergiant that we've discovered, biggest star yet, UY Scuti. <laughs> if you can find the spot that indicates the sun, that is the comparison to this hypergiant. So our star is out of the ordinary? No. It's nothing compared to what is actually still out there. That is basically the structure of the sun. The core, where it all happens, roughly about 15.6, 15.7 million degrees. So that's not the place for a barbecue. Then you've got your radiative zone. That's where most of your radioactivity happens, your convective zone. Now, there's a lot of speculation of what happens in this zone. Now, a lot of theories exist, but there's nothing concrete that we can prove as yet. Now, a prominence basically is a lovely loop there on the sun's edge, and sometimes they go together with very violent ejections. And as you can see, this prominence here in comparison to what the earth is they are quite huge this is not the largest that has been out there yet here's a nice image of uh, various prominences that's come out and as you can see they are quite a sight to see and uh, who's got the PST they're not here now a special solar telescope with which you can actually observe these with the filters that we have, the Bada Astro uh, solar filters, you can't really observe your prominences or your filaments or even your solar phase, but more just the disk of the sun. Now, a filament is exactly the same as a prominence. The only difference there is it is on the disk of the sun itself and not on the edge here, as you can see. 
So that makes it a bit more difficult to observe, but yet sometimes you find some of them that are quite prominent. As you can see here, a filament that runs there. The bottom image from end to end is further than the distance between the Earth and the Moon. So there you can see there's the Moon and the Earth is in the bottom corner there. That's about 400,000 kilometers and this filament I think if you straighten it out will probably be about 550, 600,000 kilometers long. Huge, massive. Yeah. When you say it's the same as a, as a problem, do you mean it's also something that comes out of the... Or yes, it, 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 it also a forms a loop and sometimes ejects, but the reason why you can't see that loop or the, the, the ejection is because it's flat on the surface of the sun. So you see it as a sort of like a crack. Had it been not face on but side on, then you would see the coronal loop and also the CME that came from that. It's exactly the same thing. It's exactly the same thing, yeah. Two different names depending on your vantage point. Here's a nice uh, image in various uh, filters or frequencies of how a flare basically starts. As you can see it grows more and more and more violent up until here, which is a massive, massive ejection. Here's some more. Uh, filaments the one here in the bottom again there is a comparison to the uh, sorry to the solar flare and the earth as you can see they are quite dangerous <laughs> now what's up with that what do these three things solar flares Parliament and ESCOM have in common. Yes. Solar flares causes cell phone interruptions, radio transmissions, and also electrical power outages. What does Parliament provide us with? Cell phone jamming. What does ESCOM not provide us with? Electricity, exactly. So, but please do not confuse the solar flare with either the parliament or ESCO. Okay, right? As you can see there, please do not confuse them because only one of these three got the power of attraction. And we know which one that is. <laughs> now, my favorite uh, subject is sunspots. Records dating back as early as 28 BC when the Chinese first saw these little spots on the sun. They initially thought now it's birds flying past or dust or some object passing in front of the sun. Up until 1610 when Galileo finished his brilliant telescope, looked at the sun and saw exactly the same. This evidently was his very first recording of sunspots. So he followed those and then realized that it's not an object passing in front of the disk it's actually on the disk of the sun this is an image um, of ar2192 um what have we got there the penumbra as you can see these light gray areas that's the penumbra that's normally a smooth surface or a smooth area of the sun and then you've got the umbra which is the darker areas and the pores are these smaller little dots that eventually grow bigger and become their own spots as well. Now the cycle between a minimum and maximum is normally 11 years. The average is 11 years, but it varies between 8 to 13 years. And also your number of sunspots vary in that regard. Sorry Chris, um, what is the fix? Um, what is the sunspot, the, the number of sunspots affect the number of uh, radio frequency? I'm not too sure. I've not, I'm not that scientifically advanced to tell you that. Um, but that could be basically because of the radiation as well. Because what you normally find, usually like with a pair of sunspots like that, you will have a coronal loop or a filament or a prominence. 
and once that ejects obviously there's a lot of energy with that so that could perhaps affect your radio frequencies also another thing is with solar flares that are ejected I mean those things travel miles into space now what happens if a satellite gets in the way of that extra crispy okay it toasts that satellite now what about the data that's been collected by that satellite is that lost no, that's correct. What they do is they relay the information from that satellite to another satellite or various other satellites which not in the path of that flare. So there goes a couple of billion dollars. Gone. But at least the data is saved. This is another example. This is the same sunspot that we had earlier, AR2192. This is about a month later and was then classified as AR2253. Um, they refer to this as the bear claw because of its sort of resemblance of a bear claw. You've got the palm here and then sort of like the three fingers there. Again, as you can see clearly, the penumbra and the umbra in there. Now, the sunspots appear darker, but it's also, again, more just an illusion. They are a bit cooler than the surface of the sun. Here you can see what I've been doing uh, over the last, well, basically starting mid-October as Sunspot AR2192 started right there on the limb, moving across the disc uh, in a period of about 11 days. Oh. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> now for a Sunspot to cross basically the Sun's disc or the face is anything from about, again, 11 to 14 days. Here we've got 11 days passing from the one side to the other side and then it reappeared again right here on the edge uh, around mid-November, the 13th of November to be exact. And again it passed and but now you'll see the numbers changed. I will get to that again just now. And again it moved across the surface of the sun in about 11 days again disappearing right there on the limb again making its return I only caught it a bit later on the 1st of January where it's already on the face so probably around the 28th to 29th of December it appeared again and it continued up until the 8th of January when it disappeared on the other side now sunspots can last anything from a couple of hours literally to months I think the longest recorded sunspot, Alka, correct me if I'm wrong, is about a hundred days that it was visible. So that's over three months that it was seen, basically returning roughly every two weeks. Now, why is it important to record sunspots? Simple, because this is the data that you collect. This is from September up until mid-February. The bottom line here shows you the number of groups and the top line your sunspots for every day. As I said before, your solar cycles run um, over 11 year period, but they are never the same. They always vary. Now, currently we are approaching, or well actually not approaching, we've already reached the peak of the solar maximum. That was last year, April. So at this point in time, we're basically on that curve going down. So in the next maybe five six years it's not going to be as active on the sun we had a look just now and there's a possibility of about maybe one little sunspot so obviously activity starts declining now sunspots rotate from east to west like i said they take almost 14 days to pass across the sun's disk now, the term active region um, is when there are more than one spot and they form a group so obviously two or more spots is then termed as an active region and every time that grouping reappears it is allocated a new number as we saw with AR2192 that returned three times and was then allocated different numbers um, every time this is just to give you a bit of an idea the top 10 largest sunspots in the last 100 years 19 
17, um, the comparative size of the sunspot was 21 times that of the Earth. Then 1926, 22 times. 1938, 21 times. Uh, and again, 1938, uh, 20 times. 1946, 30 times. Uh, again, another one in 1946, 27 times. 1947, 26 times. Then again, 1947, 36 times the size of the Earth. Just one sunspot. That's that's a grouping of sunspots, yeah. That is to date the largest recorded sunspot in the history. Now if you take the Earth's diameter is twelve thousand seven hundred kilometers, multiply that by thirty-six. That'll give you more or less an idea of what the length or the size of that sunspot must have been. And then we've got another one at 28 times in 1951 and 1989 at 21 times. Now, AR2192 that started in October was the biggest since 1989 in the last, what's about, 24 odd years. That doesn't even reach here. That was only 16 times the size of the Earth. Very important safety when observing the sun. This is something that is of cardinal importance. Passing around an eyepiece that was used to view the sun with without <laughs> the sun's acting up again. That was viewed without any protective filters and as you can see, that's, that's pretty hard plastic. If the sun can do that to hard plastic, imagine what it will do to your eyes. So never look at the sun directly, no matter what. Don't use CDs or tin foil or uh, candy wrappers. They may block out the light of the sun, but they do not stop the radiation. And that can severely damage your eyes, your eyesight, and even blind you. You'll see that I make a lot of mention don't look at the sun because it is very important. Never, never, never look at it directly. There are many ways in which you can actually look at the sun to your benefit and without damage. Now the easiest way or the most effective way is through projection and the best way to do that is with a refractor. That is basically where you set up your scope in line with the sun and have that image projected on a piece of paper that you hold where your light exits. There you can see an example of it. You've got your refractor, just a cardboard collar to block out the rest of the sun and it projects an image right back onto that. This way, no damage to your eyes whatsoever. What about the eyepiece? Hmm? What about the eyepiece blow? That's without the eyepiece. The eyepiece that I'm passing around now was done with that and it basically got fried. There was no eye attached to this, huh? No. No, they still, yeah. <laughs> now, there's another way of, of doing projection and that's called a pinhole camera where you can take a box, cut out the square, cover it with foil and literally make a pinprick in it piece of white paper at the back and there you go again you can see the sun's image you can see the disc and sometimes you are lucky enough to actually then observe sunspots that way as well now again those Prada or Mancini or Pitbull shoe boxes that we always throw away you can put them to very good use cost effective and absolutely safe you've got your pinhole there your white paper that is your surface that reflects the image and right here that's your viewing area so you are even standing with your back to the sun here's a bit more advanced way a lovely reflective telescope that was built with uh, a decent solar filter and like you see lovely sunspots that you can observe that way and this is without looking even directly at the sun. 
This just to give you an idea of the different filters and what they look like. The first one there is a Mylar filter. Gives you a bit of a, a bluish color. But the advantages of that, it's a very nice, crisp and clear image that you get from that. The second one is a Bada Planetarium filter. Gives a bit of an orange haze to it. And then the last one, what I use is the Bada Astro Safety Solar Fill. That's a normal about A4 sheet that you can cut into any size that suits you. You can fit it to your scope, you can fit it to your camera, any which way that you like. How many of you guys have bought a telescope where in your eyepiece kit you received a sun filter? Good, I'm glad. That thing, if you get that, throw it away, it means nothing. Because you cannot block the sun's light where it exits. It means nothing. This glass that they use here is not specialized. It's tinted <coughs> glass or darkened glass or they use welder's glass but not strong enough. Yes. Why, why are they allowed to sell it then? Hmm? Why are they allowed to sell it then? There's no, the, there's, there's no law that prohibits them from doing so. I mean, if someone goes blind, couldn't they sue them? You know? In the States, they probably do. Yeah. All made in China. <laughs> China is just changed yeah, jobs. <laughs> yes. <laughs> These things are rubbish. You can put them in, and I guarantee you, within two seconds, that piece of glass will crack because the concentration of the sun's heat alone, let alone the light and energy, is enough to crack that piece of glass. I did a little bit of an experiment about a year ago where I used a four and a half millimeter piece of glass. It was so dark, I think, yeah, it's about four and a half millimeters thick. I used that, put it in a filter at the back, on an eyepiece at the back. Almost three seconds. Crack, right down the middle. And I couldn't touch it. That's how hot it was. Because you've got the sun's image, if you're looking at using a Dobsonian, into one mirror, then it's condensed into your secondary mirror, and from there, reflected. So, we all, when we were small, used little magnification glass and burned the little ants. Now, magnify that by about a thousand times, and that's what cracks these things. So, if ever you get a telescope, buy a telescope, or get it as a present, then get that, chuck it, let it go, you don't need it. Okay, now, observing the sun, what do you look for? First, look for groups of sunspots. Yeah, you've got a nice grouping of sunspots. Then you look for individual spots. Now here, we don't, oh, there we've got one individual, but three groups in general. Then you look at location, location, location. <laughs> All right? <laughs> Large sunspots, um, especially near the limb, which is the, darker outer edge of the sun like that just a bit on 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 the limb that's what we basically refer to this dark ring can anybody tell me why that outer bit is darker than the rest of the disc it's not as hot no it's pretty much the same temperature it's the angle, it's the angle. The angle the light. Light. that's right because this area here when you're looking at it through a telescope is a bit thicker than when you're looking at it straight face on so you're looking through a lot more here that's why you always have a bit of darkening of the limb so when you look at the sun or you take an image don't be distraught when you get an image like this and you, oh but it's not perfect it's not <sighs> there's uh, it doesn't look nice but that's how it should be there's nothing wrong with that image now recording your observations <coughs> Keep your observations, don't write them on little pieces of paper, keep them in a file or in a book and you can actually always refer back to them. Now with doing that, it helps you develop your skills because you can see over a period of time from how you started observing and how you've progressed from there. Now what information is important on there? Your date? Well, the format is not really, uh, I would say, of much significance. As long as you can state what year, month, and day that it was, your time, 
Normally what we refer to in time is universal time. Now universal time in South Africa is our standard time minus two hours. Yeah, England time. Why do we use universal time when we record observations? It's standardized throughout the world. It's standardized throughout the world. So if we communicate with astronomers in the Americas, in Asia, in Europe, we're all on the same time scale. So if I say it was 12.15 universal time, they will know exactly what time it was because they will then subtract or add according to what their time zones are. Uh, then obviously your instrumentation that you use give us an idea of what size or what instrument it is for example 6 inch Dobsonian or a 60 mil refractor then your magnification if you know what your magnification of your eyepieces are now you can tell me how do you calculate your magnification Chris <laughs> that's it that's the one way. The other way is the diameter of the telescope by the, divided by the um, executor of the eyepiece. That's right, yeah. So, for instance, 48 magnification with a 25mm eyepiece. My Dobsonian, the focal length is 1200. So, 25 divided by 1200 gives you a 48 magnification. Then, you note what the viewing conditions are excellent good moderate or poor and even your air transparency now last night we would have stated poor yeah and then excellent and then good and then poor and then poor and then poor and then moderate and then poor straight out um today well with the sun we would have started off poor all the way and now i think we approaching good now as you do your um, observations and you keep a record of that sometimes you find these fluctuations where you get a drop okay you will also find that you have significant drops but when there's something like that it's probably because of your quality of your air these are done over a period of time this was oh, can't quite make out it's a bit small but it's not consecutive days <coughs> Uh, Leslie, can you make out the dates there? It's a bit small, eh? Very small. Yeah. This was probably from there to there was probably in about a week and a half's time. Now, obviously, there's a lot of factors involved there. And I can guarantee you the most predominant one there is your transparency or your viewing conditions where there was some form of cloud cover or pollution. What's the Y axis? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that is your number of what? Uh, number of sunspots oh, okay. yeah it calculates the number of sunspots and also gives you an indication as to the number of groups so yeah you've got your number and then just the date there this is just this is not a standardized uh, graph this is just basically my own graph that I've done for my own observations you can if you want to add a graph to your observations or your record you can do it any which way you want I'm not aware of any standard formula of doing it. This is just easier for me and it works for me basically. Right, now a bit of more on the technical side of your Zurich index. Now that is what they use to basically keep record of your sunspots and your groups. Now this is a very simple formula to use. Your RZ, that is your Zurich index number. Your K, that is your uh, coefficient. And that is at one. Currently, the accepted average by the International uh, Astronomy uh, Society is, uh, I think, it's 0 0.9, whereas it used to be 0 0.6, but they've increased that to 0 0.9, but rounded off to one. Your 10 is the weighted value assigned to a group. G is the number of sunspots, uh, sunspot groups, and F the number of individual sunspots. Now, what you do is you basically look at your image. And you will see that there are one, two, three, four groups. So you basically substitute your G for four. And then you count the individual spots 
and there's 15 spots. You do your formula, it's quite simple. 10 times 4 is 40, plus 15 um, gives 55, times 1 is equal to 55. And that then is your daily Zurich index number for your observations. What I've done here from September to December, I've recorded it, and the total Zurich index number for September is 267. It seems low, but those are only two days of observations. Um, October is a bit higher at 603. November it's gone down a bit to uh, 458. And December was also, I think there was only three days of observation there. And that was at 174. But if you track that over a longer period of time and at a greater frequency, obviously your figures will be a little bit higher. And you can actually then track your sun and how it progresses through that 11 year cycle. Sorry, um, what is that, that 10 value based on? Yeah. It's like an arbitrary number. It is basically, um, it's quite difficult to explain, it's a bit technical. Um, they use it in basically a series of numbers where they started with 1 and worked up to a value of 10. This is determined by, by, like years, of data or by years of data and how they basically um, work it out. I'm not, I can't give you an exact answer. I'm not that afraid with exactly how they determine it, but currently it is set at 10. Does it fluctuate? Um, it actually doesn't fluctuate. It goes up. Oh. So it's basically now at 10. The next number obviously will be 11, but I don't know when that will be. All right. That's it, people. Any questions? Uh, that Zurich number, where do you get that? that, uh, that um, the formula. Uh, that, that constant. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> basic value to you. That, that's the 10. Yeah. Yeah. That's basically <laughs> what he asked as well. I, I didn't hear. Well, the, the, um, the website. Uh, actually, I got that from Jacques van Delft, uh, former director for the solar section of Vasa. Chris, I think they publish, I happen to, happen to know this, I think they publish that value every year in the Almanac. Okay. So where, as you said, where they get the number from, the sun spot, the cause will know. They publish that number which is then used to calibrate the index. That's right, yeah. That is, it's basically called a reduction coefficient. Um, to basically compensate for what your viewing conditions are and to set the standard so that mine will my observations will be more consistent with your observations. Is there no further questions? For Chris? I'm sure you can grab during the course of the rest of the moment today. I'll still be around until tomorrow afternoon. Right. Thank you everybody.